Okay. Got it. I guess got to push got it here. Got it. Got it. Hey, Tom. Tom Wilson, what a pleasure it is to uh, have this opportunity to have a conversation with you um, with this project, Echoes of the Flame, art inspired by the lyrics of the Tragically Hip. Uh, like I said, we're just really grateful to have you a part of this show. Uh, you came into it with, um, you know, the knowledge that this is something very personal to you and something that you felt connected to right off the bat from conception, from the idea when I pitched it to you, I said, would you be interested in mm -hmm. your painterly skills to create some sort of um, representation of the lyrics of the Tragically Hip, and you had the opportunity to choose anything within the 30 plus year catalog of the Tragically Hip. And I, I didn't sense any hesitation from you whatsoever. And so I'm really curious as to, you know, what your first initial reaction was when I, when I pitched the idea, uh, what were you, what were you thinking? Well, I thought it's about time and I'm glad that somebody came up with this idea. The Tragically Hip were a band uh, that managed to be able to resonate across uh, the board from university students uh, to junior B hockey players to, um, deep into the hearts of the working man in Canada and around the world um, on, on both uh, poetic and musical levels. I don't even think that most of the people, uh, I, well, I actually, I can't take anybody, I take nobody for granted. But, um, you know, the Tragically Hip started off as a great rock and roll band with a genius poet who, uh, they had songs on the radio that, uh, united the country in so many ways, united the spirit of Canada and represented us all around the world. They were kind of like the best team Canada that we could have put together. Um, but what they, what they, what I believe Gord did was uh, evolve deeper as an artist and uh, saw the importance of his voice and uh, knew that it was a way to make change, uh, important change in our country. His passing was, uh, in fact, I watched their last concert only recently, and it's, it's almost unbearable to watch, you know, for anybody who uh, loved that band. But, um, you know, picking up that sword that uh, that Gord left on the ground is important. And I think that that's uh, what this show is doing. It definitely is what my role is uh, going to be in this show. I agree. Uh, I mean, you, I like to, to call you and you've probably been called this before, um, a Renaissance man. You know? huh. <laughs> I think it's a pretty cool thing that to be called, you know, a man of many talents and areas of knowledge. And, you know, you're a songwriter, musician, a writer, and also a fine artist. And, um, you know, you bring so much to this project um, in terms of your experience as a songwriter. So you can definitely relate um, to, you know, what it's like to express yourself uh, lyrically and poetically in a song. So when you're using lyrics from another artist from, and, and then using that as the inspiration, you probably have a another perspective, another level of what maybe the songwriter is trying to achieve. You know, there's the music and sonical, you know, sonic side versus the, you know, the written, you know, a lot, some people when they listen to music, they're only feeling the music and feeling the actual energy. They're not listening necessarily to the words. Um, you know, I was like that you know, early on throughout and I've been a huge music fan, but a lot of times I really didn't focus all that much on lyrics because I was just feeling the music on such a powerful level. And then as I evolved as a human being and got more into writing, I, I actually focused more on, on what they were trying to say and how they were saying it. So what, you know, what do you think um, as a songwriter, do you think that Gordowney and the band were trying to, um, you know, trying to do through their, um, their songwriter and their storytelling? Um, I think that they were sweeping into the corners of, uh, of Canada, uh, finding the stories and uh, finding the elements that united us. We are a giant country 
and only seven people live here. So you've already met one of us today. So now you only got six more people to meet in Canada. It's a giant country that's all spread out, you know, and uh, to be able to unite uh, uh, music listeners and art lovers from Brandon, Manitoba, you know, to Cayuga, Ontario, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, Halifax, Nova Scotia, you know, to Langley, BC, you know, that's a, that's a trick, man. And uh, that's a trick that I don't think that the band, the band set out definitely to be popular. Gord Downey was a fierce competitor, but uh, I, I actually think that they discovered something about what they were creating uh, that they started to really take advantage of. And that was being able to uh, unite a country um, through music and through words. Uh, to tell stories about what was going on. I mean, the whole the whole job of storytellers, you know, it's it's an ancient craft, and and it's me taking the stories from that are told around my fire, and bringing them over to your fire, Joe, you know, and uh, the tragically hip managed uh, to do that. You know, they told uh, they told stories about uh, uh, the the uh, human condition in Canada. And uh, they they dug into history, they dug into hockey players, they dug into social injustice, and um, and at the end, uh, Gord uh, Gord uh, went out went straight to the throat, um, opening a discussion about residential schools in this country that uh, otherwise wasn't happening in certain populations. I had the I still have the privilege to be able to be asked by i guess uh um the downey winjack foundation to get out there uh right around uh, gord's birthday and do a series of shows um you know that revolve around the secret path and it's honoring tragically hip shows and i've stood on that stage the first little while in beautiful theaters and um i've watched tragically hip fans uh fans who came to see the hip uh, who maybe would have gone and seen a tragically hip cover band in a bar, but ended up in a in a in a theater at that time, and they were there to hear hip songs. And some of them might have been, you know, old junior hockey players, or some of them might have just been, you know, guys and gals in the front row with their shirts off, screaming songs at at the hip. Um, but you could see the complexion of the audience change as we started to address. Uh, residential schools as we started to address the fact that thousands upon thousands of children were murdered at the hands of colonialism in our country. That story is something that uh, was Gord's last statement. That's the sword that I'm picking up. Mm, yeah. Because I, I, we, I, as, as a Mohawk, I can't let that story die. As a Mohawk, I believe that story is just starting to be told. And as we start to tally up, I don't know the number now, but possibly around 6,000 Indigenous children that have been buried in residential school grounds, the Indigenous world uh, estimates it's more like 30 to 40 to 50,000 children. And uh, I don't know how many schoolyards across Canada have graveyards in them. I don't think any. I think the only mm. schools that had uh, graveyards in them were run by the churches and uh, the Canadian government. So there's some work to be done in this country. And I don't stand here just to point fingers. And I don't create art just to make people feel bad. I want to keep a discussion going, an important discussion. I want to continue a discussion that has been in the indigenous community, that has been in my mother's life. She's 83 years old, and she's been telling these stories her entire life. Gord Downey managed to pick that up so that my mother's voice can be heard now. That's where I'm at. I hear you, and your piece is extremely powerful. I'm going to show it here um, just now. I'm going to share my screen so people can see. Um, hold on one second. Technology, eh? 
It's it's murderous. Okay, here it is. You see it? Mm -hmm. So here's your painting, and um, to your point about you know going from one campfire to another campfire, that metaphor really resonates with with us over here at Songbird. Um, that's what we believe we're doing. We're taking the flame from one creative force, that energy, the songwriter, and we're merging that with the, the fire, the creative force of the fine artist. And together those two flames, you know, combine to a much stronger flame. And mm -hmm. sharing, that's what we do. We're the conduit for sharing that, that uh, united flame uh, to, the, to new audiences. And so what they're doing is they're seeing uh, visually a representation of a song and lyrics that they are already emotionally connected to, but seeing it represented in some new way. And so here you've got um, a, a nun, and actually it's eight foot tall, right? It's eight feet um, yeah. created on a wood panel, right? And it is uh, a nun. And uh, maybe you could just describe a little bit about what the details of it and how you came about to you know, conceive of this, uh, this representation. Now, I came about it because there was a silhouette of a nun uh, uh, with a bunch of indigenous students from a uh, uh, probably a National Film Board of Canada uh, documentary film. Uh, there was propaganda films that were made by the Canadian government to, to show the good lives that uh, indigenous children were leaving, leading uh, inside the walls of, of residential schools. Um, I took one of those nuns. It's, it's a simple drawing. I mean, may I say, Joe, that I'm not an artist. I just like to paint. I'm also, I write books, um, but I have difficulty reading them because I'm dyslexic. Uh, and I'm really not much of a musician, but I've been doing it for 47 years. <laughs> so, I, I don't know what the hell's going on, obviously. I've never yeah. heard someone introduce themselves quite like that before. That was, that was oh, well, you know what? Not many people are as honest as me, Joe. That's <laughs> that's what it comes down to. But uh, so the, the piece evolved from a little sketch that I did of this nun from this uh, NFB film. And then I put it on a 10 foot painting. Uh, I painted two, two of those nuns and in the middle of it, um, a uh, two uh, in, indigenous Mohawk warriors uh, with this uh, imaginary crow ceremony uh, evolving from the center of these nuns. Um, and that painting still exists in my studio. It's, it's not done yet, but uh, it will be done. And I thought that, uh, that, this was, uh, that those nuns were a great representation to what, it, what I wanted to do with Gord Downey's lyrics. I mean, you, uh, you gotta remember that uh, we are not competing with with an absolutely uh, genius artist, uh, but we're just trying to run as fast as he did, you know. So um, as as a writer and as a musician and as a visual artist, uh, I felt that I had to run as fast or try to run as fast as Gord Downey did. And I also wanted to do something that um, that he would nod his head and say, "Yeah, that that's right. That that's exactly." That's exactly the point that I was trying to make. So I wrote the lyrics, uh, his lyrics in, in, the, uh, in the piece, in The Nun. And then I wrote, uh, in sections of The Nun, I wrote the names of uh, uh, a couple thousand uh, murdered Indigenous students' bodies that were found uh, on the grounds of residential schools. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty bold on my part, but what the fuck, Joe? <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, we we fully support boldness here. Uh, we have a, a number of bold pieces, but in this exhibition, none quite as bold as this one. Um, and I think what that does is it adds texture, it adds nuance, and it adds truth to this exhibition because most people um, in the exhibition, we have 18 pieces, and there's, you know, naturally people gravitate toward songs that have um, you know a certain energy that they can relate to or certain meshes that they can relate to so of course you know New Orleans is sinking and we have blow at high dough and we have poets and we have you know even some of the more current stuff um, as well but you went to something that spoke incredibly uh, personally to you 
And I think that's the power of, of, you know, a legacy of music is that you do, you know, as the band evolved and the band, his voice grew, yeah, he knew that he, like you said earlier, he had a platform, he had an audience and, you know, he felt compelled to, um, to share that, uh, that message, something that is really important. And then you picked up that sword and you, you know, are wielding it. And so we're really excited to see what kind of energy we get back from this visual representation where, you know, what kind of conversation it's going to ignite or, and keep alive, certainly. So um, really grateful to have that part of the exhibition. It's really important, especially considering um, the, uh, the component to the exhibition where we're donating money to help a, a cultural and language center build a school to teach students their indigenous language. So obviously it's important to the hip and that's why we're donating a portion of the proceeds from the sale of the original art to that organization. And if we can, you know, pick up that sword as well to your, in your words, and, um, and, and drive it forward and do good, then, you know, we're all, we're, we've all been influenced by, by Gordon, the band. That's it's true. I'm so glad that that, I'm so glad the hip are, uh, are sending that money there. I mean, I'm, I'm one of those kids that, uh, that, uh, was stripped of his, uh, the opportunity to have his language or his culture or his colors. Um, so uh, as a 60s scoop kid, as they refer me to me, um, this school is really, really important. Um, I'm 63 years old. The chances of me learning Mohawk in the next 20 years, I hope that I have on this planet are pretty slim. But if we can start uh, protecting the language, languages that this country has uh, attempted to wipe out, then, then the hip man, they're always doing the right thing. <laughs> you know that the hip are the hip are always on top of it. Yeah, well, we're we're honored to be doing this uh, exhibition and, and in partnership with the band, you know, they're involved in um, helping to oversee the artist selection. So, you know, when I proposed Tom Wilson, there was a lot of enthusiasm and they're like, oh, good. Now we love that guy. We absolutely love that guy. I've, I've known those guys a long time. I've known those guys. Uh, you know, I actually uh, wrote a story for my second book about meeting them. And it was when I was in a band, the Florida Razors. And we were in a hotel room, the Prince George Hotel in Kingston, all middle of the afternoon, drinking beer, playing cards and snorting speed. And, <laughs> and a knock came to the door and there was these like really fresh faced guys and they said, we're fans of your band and we have your record and we came to see you and this and that. And uh, I said, oh, yeah. They said, we have a band, too. We're in high school. We have a band. I said, what's the name of your band? They said, the Tragically Hip. I said, wow, <laughs> that's a great name. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't know how the, if they could play their instruments, at all, but they had a name that definitely uh, was, was going to ring supreme, you know. And as it turned out, uh, they are... Uh, possibly the mightiest force uh, that has ever come out of this country and uh, long live the hip long live the hip awesome dude well we look forward to having your uh, your piece in the exhibition is going to be there July the 8th until August the 28th yep. and people can go to Bracebridge Hall it's in Muskoka uh, we chose Muskoka because uh, to your points you know listening to the music sitting around a campfire uh, it's just a part of the, the fabric of so many people's lives. It's the soundtrack of their lives, including my own. Um, and, you know, so that's, we wanted to be in that environment, something that felt, you know, really authentic to, to the experience of the music. And so we, really, we achieved that with this little venue in Bracebridge called the Bracebridge Hall. So it's, hopefully people get a chance to, to come. And it's, got a, it's also a live music venue as well. So we're going to have live music. Sky Diggers are actually playing there on the 8th. And hopefully in your schedule, I know we talked about this offline, but maybe at some point we'll, we'll see you there. But I'd love to be there. My schedule, I don't know. Like I said, I'm 63 years old and people are more interested in me than, a, than the, the previous 63 years. So um, if I can get if I can get there to play for you, I definitely will. You're a fine wine, you man. You're, you're improving with the way <laughs> it should be. Some say. All right, cool. Well, great talking to you. And we will see you um, down the line in a little bit. But again, thank you very much for, for all your energy and your, your you know, your, your heart and uh, your soul. Thank you, Joe. Love and uh, rave on, buddy. We'll see you soon. All right, bud. Take care. Okay. Thanks.